Well, it's lovely to be here again. I've been here every year since the college started. And um, it's one of my favorite places to come and to teach. And I'm particularly honored that Satish is here this evening. And um, so I'm very pleased to see him. This is an unexpected surprise, Satish. Um, there's a big change going on in the scientific world. The dominant orthodoxy of materialism, which has dominated science since the late 19th century, is crumbling. It's, it's falling apart. Uh, so the sciences are bursting out of this framework of thinking. This is the theme of my book, The Science Delusion, Freeing the Spirit of Inquiry. Um, what's emerging patchily in different areas of science is a much more holistic uh, approach to nature. And that's, of course, what Schumacher College has been uh, talking about and, and propagating uh, ever since it started. But things are happening faster than they've happened before. I've, I've thought for years we're on the brink of a massive paradigm change. I think it's uh, more than ever now. Uh, there are many more signs of an enormous change happening. And as this change occurs, it opens up a completely new set of possibilities for dialogues and discussion of the area between science and spirituality. And I'm going to talk about some of those areas this evening. It's a huge topic, and I don't have time to cover more than a few. But I'm going to start uh, with the idea of the extended mind. There's a growing um, feeling among people who think about the nature of the mind that consciousness simply can't be explained in the materialist way as nothing but the brain. And um, one of the interesting concepts that's now quite widespread is that the mind is much more extensive than the brain. Um, my own interpretation is that it, the, the minds extend beyond brains through fields. We're used to the idea of fields extending beyond material objects. A magnetic field is in a magnet and stretches invisibly beyond it. The Earth's gravitational field is in the Earth and stretches beyond it, keeping the Moon in its orbit. It's keeping us down on the floor now. It, without it, although it's invisible, uh, we'd be floating around. And the field of your mobile telephone, happily turned off at present, um, uh, is inside the mobile telephone and stretches out invisibly far beyond it. This room is full of invisible transmissions of mobile phones, radio and television. So fields extend beyond material objects, and I think minds extend beyond brains. This has testable consequences. I'm going to be talking much more detail about this tomorrow as part of my course here, but I'll just give a couple of highlights here. Uh, this means that when you pay attention to something, for example, when you look at something, uh, your mind is reaching out and touching what you're paying attention to. The very word attention means that, ad tendere in Latin, to stretch towards. Your mind stretches out towards what you're paying attention to. Now, this means you might be able to affect things just by looking at them. And um, it may seem improbable at first in the abstract, but when you think about it in concrete terms, if I looked at you from behind and you didn't know I was there, could you feel me looking at you? You realize this is a common phenomenon. The sense of being stared at it has been experienced by more than 90% of people, as surveys show, including children. And a lot of research has now been done on the sense of being stared at, showing this is real. It's something that occurs in animals as well as people. I think it probably evolved in the first place in the context of predator-prey relationships. A prey animal that could feel a hidden predator looking at it would stand a better chance of escaping one than one that couldn't feel it. So I think this is basic biological. It's not just human. Um, in most modern humans, it's an utterly neglected part of our uh, abilities. It's not mentioned in the educational system. It, there's virtually no research on it within universities because it ought not to happen from a materialist point of view because the mind ought to be all inside the head. But it does happen, and I think it's one sign that the mind stretches beyond the brain. Now, I think our minds also extend beyond our brains through our intentions. And intentions can have an effect at a distance. This is one of the ways in which uh, telepathy is manifested. Telepathy typically occurs between bonded members of social groups. 
It occurs between humans who are closely bonded, usually between close members of families, mothers and children, spouses, lovers, um, close friends. Um, and uh, it also happens in animal groups and uh, between humans and animals. When people keep dogs or cats, uh, the animals form a strong bond very often and this can often be the basis of telepathy. I think telepathy is a normal means of communication among animals. It's normal, not paranormal, natural, not supernatural. There's now been quite a bit of research on telepathy. In fact, it started in the 1880s with the founding of the Society for Psychical Research. But um, there's been new lines of research in telepathy in the last 20 years or so. One of them has been with animals. This has been one of the areas I myself have worked in. Um, because I think telepathy is a normal animal ability, um, not a special human ability, but a normal animal ability, I did research on it first of all, first of all in animals. Um, and I found there had been virtually no previous research on this subject. So I started, uh, as one does in science, with natural history. Um, I collected stories from people who keep cats, dogs, horses, parrots and other animals and I collected stories from vets and animal trainers and jockeys and police dog handlers and blind people with guide dogs and so on uh, to find out what they'd noticed. Can their animals pick up their intentions? Well, many, many people think they can. For example, I have more than 200 stories where people say their cat seems to know when they're going to take it to the vet. The cat disappears. <laughs> and um, it, the, I had so many of these stories, we did a survey of vets, all the vets in the North London Yellow Pages, 65 of them. We rang them up and said, do you ever have a problem with people missing the appointment with the cat? And 64 out of 65 said, it happens all the time. And the remaining one said, it happens so often we've given up the appointment system for cats. <laughs> and, 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 um, we've done random household surveys uh, about pets picking up people's intentions and one of the commonest ways they pick up people's intentions is when people are planning to go away. Dogs and cats seem to pick it up before people start packing suitcases or giving all the obvious cues. Nobody's particularly impressed by this if the animal sees them carrying a suitcase to the door and loading up the car and things. It's before that that they seem to sense it. About 65% of dogs and cats seem to be sensitive to uh, people going away in advance. That's harder to test because people are in the same house. The phenomenon that's easiest to test scientifically is dogs and cats that know when their owners are coming home. And as some of you know, as many of you know, I, I've done a lot of work on that. Uh, we do experiments on this uh, to rule out the obvious explanations. Many people, have about 50% of uh, dog owners and about 30% of cat owners, find that their animals anticipate the arrival of the member of a family by going and waiting at a door or a window. Um, they do this even when the people at home don't know when the person's coming, and even when they're coming at non-routine times in unfamiliar vehicles. So we've done lots of experiments on this. These are published in scientific papers, in peer-reviewed journals, and they're summarised in my book, on unexplained animal powers called dogs that know when their owners are coming home. Um, now, in these experiments, we film the place the dog waits. We have the person go at least five miles away. Uh, they come home at a randomly chosen time that they don't know in advance. And uh, we, uh, to avoid them picking up the sound of a familiar car, they travel by taxi. Taxi fares are the most expensive aspect of this research. Um, and so, uh, what we find is that over and over again, the most sensitive dogs uh, just do this uh, and they start waiting when the owner decides to come home. It's not the sound of getting into a car, it's anyway, it's an unfamiliar car and they're way beyond earshot, more than five miles away. It seemed, the dog seems to be responding to their intention to come home. It's picking up their thoughts or intentions. Now, there have been many of these experiments, but I have a video which I'm going to show now. Uh, some of you may have seen it before. It's the most famous dog that knows when its owner's coming home, a British terrier called JT that, now dead, but lived near Ramsbottom, Lancashire. Um, this film uh, was done by the science unit of Austrian State Television, ORF. Um, 
they sent over the science unit to check up my experiments, see if it really worked, and they wanted to do a real experiment, and I was quite happy for them to do that. They filmed it much more professionally than my own films of these dogs. Um, and so uh, what we're going to do now is see that film uh, from ORF. It's only about five minutes. Now, the soundtrack um, is in German. Uh, don't worry, it is an English-speaking dog. Uh, but um, um, but um, there's subtitles uh, for those whose German isn't up to speed, and I'm afraid people in that part of the room aren't going to see very well. Um, Can you see at all from the back over there? I mean, you may, if you move to the corner, you might see better. So you won't all be able to read the subtitles. I'll just give a brief commentary. This is Pam. There's JT. Her parents noticed the dog knew when she was coming home for years. Um, they used to look after it when she was out. So they're setting up an experiment with two cameras. They're going to synchronize them. One camera will film JT at home and the other will follow Pam. So it's 11 o'clock in the morning. Pam goes out, leaving the dog at home with, with her parents. Meanwhile, <laughs> JT stays peacefully by Pam's mother's feet. So Pam doesn't know when they're going to go home. Um, her parents and the cameraman in her home don't know when she's going. They're going at a randomly chosen time. Now, it's 10 to 3. This is the time they've chosen to tell her to go home. So they're just going to tell her to go home now. And now you'll see in split screen, JT at exactly the same time. So 11 seconds after they told Pam to go to home, he, he was in position by the window. 
She's not even in the taxi yet. <clears throat> well, the, when you do telepathy experiments with people, um, they often get bored of doing it over and over again. The nice thing about dogs is they never get bored of their owners coming home. Uh, so you can repeat this kind of experiment. And I've done this many times with JT and with other dogs as well. Um, now, humans are telepathic as well. And the commonest kind of telepathy in the modern world occurs in connection with telephone calls. More than 80% of a normal population in Britain, Germany, uh, Argentina and uh, the US, where we've done surveys, have had the experience of thinking of someone for no apparent reason, then that person calls and they say, that's funny, I was just thinking about you. Or else they know who it is as soon as the phone rings before they look at the caller ID or answer it. I imagine most people here would, must have had that kind of experience. How, how many have? Well, that's certainly most people. I should say over 90%. Um, well, the standard sceptical argument for this is to say, oh, well, uh, it may look like telepathy, but actually it's just chance coincidence. You just forget the millions of times you're wrong. You think about people all the time, and you think it's telepathy if one of them then rings up. Um, so that's plausible hypothesis, but uh, in science you need not just a hypothesis, you need evidence. And, Skeptics have been saying that for a hundred years without any evidence at all. It was an evidence-free hypothesis. Um, I and others have now done many experiments on telephone telepathy. How the typical experiment works is that uh, you name, if you're the subject, you name four people you might be telepathic with, um, you give us their phone numbers, you sit at home with a landline phone being filmed on video, uh, we pick one of the four at random by the throw of a die, ring them up and ask them to call you. So the phone rings, you know it's one of these four people, but you don't know which one. And before you answer it, you have to guess which one. I think it's Mary. Hello, Mary. You're right or you're wrong. By chance, you'd be right one time in four, 25%. In these experiments, people are right about 45%. It's a massively significant effect with uh, hundreds of trials. It's a, the p-value, for those of you who are into p-values, it's a probability is one times 10 to the minus 12. These are very significant findings, and uh, these experiments have now been replicated in Holland and in Germany, in Amsterdam and Freiburg universities. I now have um, a, te a telephone telepathy test online that works on mobile phones that any one of you can do, and I invite you to try it. Um, you register, you put in the names of two people, in this case only two people that you know well, with their mobile phone numbers, then the test starts. The computer picks one of the two people, sends them a text message, and asks them to ring you uh, at a landline number, which is the computer. So you ring that number. It puts you on hold. The computer rings up the subject, if you're the subject, and it says, um, one of your two callers is on the line right now waiting to speak to you. Please guess who it is. Press 1 for Anne, press 2 for Bill. So you guess who you think it is. It records your guess, and instantly the line opens up, so you get immediate feedback. Are you right or wrong? Um, then after a minute, the call cuts off, because I'm paying for it. <laughs> uh, and, um, 
<laughs> and after a random time delay, uh, it does the same thing again. And, and you do six t trials altogether, then everyone gets an email, uh, a text message with the score. Thanks for taking part, the subject got four out of six, or whatever. In these tests, it's coming in around 58%. It's not a huge effect compared with 50% by chance, but with hundreds of trials, very significant. In my earlier experiments, we've, we tested people who thought they were particularly intuitive or telepathic. In this test, it's open to anyone, and many people who take part are skeptics or people who say it never happens in real life. You wouldn't expect them to do too well, and most of them don't. But overall, the effects are very positive. It's not dependent on distance. We've done the experiments with people in Australia calling people in Britain. It works just as well. In fact, it works slightly better because the ones in Australia were people who were very close to them emotionally, um, showing that it's what matters is uh, emotional closeness rather than physical distance. Now, I mention all this because these effects of telepathy show that intentions can affect others at a distance. When you make a phone call to someone, first you have to intend to phone them. You have to form the intention before you make the call. You want to get in touch with them. And intention, I'm suggesting, uh, reaches out even to Australia and can affect people to whom you direct it. Now, the reason that's relevant in a spiritual context is that when you're praying for somebody, intercessory prayer, um, you form an intention for that person. Uh, people often say the intention of these prayers is. It's an intention. Uh, you're praying for somebody, you want them to get better or you want them to be helped in some way. Um, and the, I'm suggesting this extension of your own mind through telepathy can link you to them. I don't think prayer is just a matter of your own mind. Positive thinking is, but I think prayer is more than that. It brings in um, the... the the invocation of a prayer, you pray to God, the Holy Spirit, the, the Blessed Virgin, Mary, or if you're a Hindu, to Sh Shiva or Vishnu, or whoever you're praying to, you're trying to enter into a much larger realm of consciousness than just your own. And you then connect that to the person who you have the intention for. And I think the telepathic link, the telepathic effects of intention, show us that intention can create connections between you and other people, or indeed animals. The dog is going waiting at the door because it's picking up its owner's intention. People who feel someone's about to ring are picking up their intention. So intention can have an effect at a distance. And many traditional spiritual practices, particularly with intercessory prayer, um, um, take for granted this intentional connection. And I think this research suggests that may well be real. So there's one connection. Now, I want to talk about different areas, and the next one is completely different. And this is to do with sacred places. All spiritual and religious traditions have the idea of sacred places. Um, temples, uh, holy rocks, uh, megaliths, like um, the, those great standing stones that we have many of from the Neolithic period here in Britain. Um, uh, there are many kinds of sacred structure. Sometimes it's sacred trees or sacred groves. But all religions have the idea that certain places are particularly sacred. And one of the features of many sacred places is that they're supposed to be a bridge between heaven and earth. They connect the earth to the sky. Um, they're a kind of gateway. In the Old Testament, there's the story of Jacob going to sleep at Bethel and uh, dreaming of the ladder connecting heaven and earth with angels ascending and descending, connecting the heavens and the earth. And then the New Te Old Testament account says he raises up a stone to commemorate this place. Well, did he raise a standing stone or did he sleep by a pre-existing standing stone? We can't know. But the principle is the same. This standing stone is one of the earliest forms of a gateway between heaven and earth. In Egypt, standing stones took on a particularly refined appearance in the form of obelisks, which are basically beautifully shaped standing stones, often monolithic. They're made of a single stone, and they often have a gold cap. Then, in the Christian tradition, many sacred places have towers or spires. Um, uh, in, the, in, in Islam, you have minarets, which these... Many traditions have these buildings that actually do reach up into the heavens and connect them with the earth. 
Now, I think this is more than symbolic. And my point here, the scientific point here, is that um, we know more than we've ever known before about the activity of the sun. And one of the things that's particularly interesting is that the sun has a solar wind, uh, which... I don't... Oh... Um, sorry. This is the Earth here in the middle, and the sun's over there. There's a solar wind, which is uh, particles, a, a whole blast of radiation and particles, charged particles coming from the sun. Uh, they compress the Earth's magnetic field. There's a kind of membrane around the Earth, the magnetopause, and there are all sorts of electrically charged layers. Here's the Earth in the center. Um, this changes day by day. Um, here's uh, from a particular day, a particular time, showing the, here's the Earth, here's the um, Earth's field, and it goes, goes away for millions of miles away from the side. It's compressed on the side of the sun with the solar wind. And the sun's activity is changing the whole time. NASA, the American Space Agency, um, has solar weather forecasts. This is from one of them. Uh, because they affect things on Earth. They affect radio transmissions. They affect um, the, the way that um, power lines can work. If you get a big solar flare, you get a blackout um, on Earth. So um, there's this enormous amount of electrical activity coming into the Earth. In the northern and southern hemisphere, it shows up as the northern lights and the southern lights. Um, but it's there all the time. And the new discovery, which is very exciting, is that when we have lightning strikes on Earth, thunderstorms, it's not just a local affair. We, most of us were brought up to believe it's like a kind of friction between the clouds and the Earth, and it's just between the thunderclouds and the Earth. No, we now know that there are, above the thunderclouds, there are sort of uh, cool plasma electric discharges that go 50 miles up and connect the thunderclouds with these electrically charged membranes that connect with the sun and the solar wind and are continually influenced by the sun. So a lightning strike is a direct electric connection which links the heavens, not just the clouds, but the sky, even the sun, ultimately, to the earth. So this isn't just symbolic, it's real. And I think one of the things that sacred places with these tall structures have always done is acted as channels for these energies from the, the sky, from the sun in particular, into the earth. Now, before people started building structures, the tallest things that got struck by lightning most were mountain tops and trees, and particularly oak trees, which are more conductive than others. Um, oh. No, that, I, we have to pass over this one. It's not working properly. Um, can you try advancing it to the next slide? That was meant to show solar flares. Ah, oh, here we are. Thank you. Here you see a lightning flash hitting a tree. And this is one reason that oaks were sacred to the Druids. They were particularly prone to be struck by lightning. And where lightning has struck, it gives a special quality to that place, which has always been regarded as a sacred place. Now... <clears throat> When people created obelisks, they too acted as conduits for lightning. This is not an Egyptian obelisk, it's the Washington Monument in, Egypt, in, Washington, uh, in Washington Memorial in Washington, D.C., where the people who built Washington, D.C. were Masons you know, in Masonic orders, and particularly influenced by Egypt. And they built this giant obelisk in the center of the capital of the United States. And sure enough, like an obelisk should, it acts as a, a, a focus for lightning. You see how the lightning is bends towards it. The, these things attract lightning. They attract it, the bigger they are, the taller they are, the larger is the area that they attract the lightning from and funnel it in to that place. This is the parish church of St. Mary Magdalene in Newark, Nottinghamshire, which is my hometown. And I show it simply to show that here is this great building it was completed the spire in 1380, just as the Black Death was striking England. Um, and this spire is towers above these quite large, ordinary, well, three-storey buildings.
But right to this day, although this was built in the 14th century, it's still far and away the tallest structure in Newark and will channel in lightning from the whole of the town into this ancient sacred place. Here's a lightning strike on St. Peter's in Rome. And this is, some of you might have seen this. It happened quite recently. When the last Pope, Benedict, retired, announced his retirement, um, a photographer went out into the streets hoping to get pictures of weeping nuns and so on. He <laughs> couldn't find any. Um, um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, but uh, instead was able to witness this remarkable lightning strike on St. Peter's, which preceded, just preceded the election of our present Pope, uh, Francis. Um, and there you see, it's a very striking and remarkable picture. Here's Christ in Rio de Janeiro, overlooking Rio de Janeiro, very frequently struck by lightning. This lightning strike uh, caused damage to his thumb. Um, <laughs> but you see again how this is curving in. If, if he wasn't there, uh, you know, it might go down that way or hit some other... So the tallest thing available becomes the magnet for this lightning strike. It channels in this energy. This is the Eiffel Tower. As soon as people got technological abilities to, to build bigger and bigger towers, then they suck in this energy too. And so this is a great 19th century engineering marvel and obviously it's going to be one of the primary attractors of lightning in Paris. And this is the Barge Tower. It's not because it's dark. You can't see. It's the tallest building in the world. It's in Dubai. And uh, these big business skyscrapers are now the primary things that suck in the lightning and, and become the principal attractors of it. So in very mo modern cities, this is, it's often these big business buildings that are the ones that are getting the energy. But in most places, thank goodness, uh, that's not so. And here in Dartington, um, the place that attracts the energy around here is the right, the, the right place to attract it, namely Dartington Parish Church, and no doubt the old town near the hall. But the, some of us went on a micro-pilgrimage to the parish church this afternoon. And I, I must say, if anyone here is a church warden or... Uh, involved with the church, I have to say how much I appreciate the fact that it's always open. Many churches are closed, and it takes effort and trust for people to keep it open and to maintain it so well, and I, for one, tremendously appreciate that. Um, anyway, sure enough, on the tower of Dartington Parish Church, there are little metal spikes on the top of every pi pi pinnacle, and there's a lightning conductor running down into the ground. Now, all churches with tires and spires will have these lightning strikes. And one of the things I'm interested in is how often lightning strikes. I mean, it's rather an interesting thing if one takes literally, and it is literal, this connection of energy from heaven to earth, from the sky into the earth. Now, it's not rocket science to develop a way of detecting a lightning surge going down a lightning conductor. I mean, this is, you know, in millions of volts, you know, things that can do enormous amount of damage. And yet, there doesn't seem to, no one seems yet to have invented a device that could record it. If you imagine an induction coil mounted on the wall next to the lightning conductor, it should be quite easy to detect and record when lightning strikes happen. And if someone invented and developed this, I'm quite sure there'd be a big market for these things, because lots of people would be interested to know when lightning hits their local sacred building. Um, so... Uh, I myself think sacred places are particularly important. I think that we all need them. All traditional societies have had them. We, we're blessed in England with these marvellous parish churches and cathedrals everywhere. And um, they're terribly underused. I mean, because of the kind of enlightenment and materialist propaganda, many people have been alienated from the Christian tradition and never enter their local church. But um, I myself think it's very important. Whenever I go to a new place... Uh, I try and find the sacred place and visit there first to sort of to pay my respects to the tutelary spirit of the place, the patron saint. Um, in, in India, I go to the local temple. In Muslim countries, to the mosque. Um, but uh, here in England, uh, the most obvious sacred places are really obvious. They're in the centre of every community and these churches and cathedrals. And so now most Church of England churches have 
candles that you can light. That was, was quite new. When I was a child, none of them had candles. Now they, all the cathedrals do, and many parish churches do, including Dartington. <coughs> Um, so it's possible to go there and light a candle and say a prayer and connect with that holy place. So my point here is that the old view that there are gateways between heaven and earth is literally true. There, there are places where there's this connection of this energy. Now, exactly what that signifies and means depends on how you understand the nature of the heavens. I myself think that the sun is not just a hydrogen bomb. I think it's a conscious being. I think the sun thinks. It's one of the things we've been talking about this week uh, here in this course. And although it's a shocking and unfamiliar thought, um, I'm not going to be able to dilate on it at the moment because I want to move on to the next topic. Um, this, this is a, a rapid uh, move through completely different aspects. Um, One of the areas that recent research has of spiritual importance that recent research has shed light on is near-death experiences. Now, it's been known for thousands of years that some people, when they almost die and come back, have an experience of going out of their body, traveling through a tunnel, seeing light, and then coming back into the body. They're usually deeply transformative. Plato describes one of these uh, in, in, in one of his works. The Venerable Bede, in his History of England, uh, in the Dark Ages, describes a near-death experience. They've been known for a long, long time. Nothing new about the experiences. Uh, what is new is that more people have them now, and they've been studied in much more detail. Far more people are now resuscitated who, in the past, would have died. Because of cardiac resuscitation units and, uh, and, and, and um, defibrillators and so on, uh, many, many people, millions of people, have now had near-death experiences. Now, the near-death experience for anyone who's had one, or for most people who've had one, is life-changing. Uh, interviews with uh, people who've had these, uh, studies on these, by, by psychologists and others, have shown that for most people, it leads to, they cease to fear death, they, their life acquires a whole new meaning, they have a sense of, that they're not just um, limited to their physical body, and so on. There's, you've, many of you have read books on this, and there have been several bestsellers recently, Abe and Alexander being the best known, a neuro, an American neurosurgeon who had a near-death experience, and his book's called, I think it's called Visions of Heaven, or A Vision of Heaven. Um, these experiences are extraordinarily moving. Now, the atheists and the skeptics, of course, can't bear this idea that there's something really significant in this. So they've all, all along, they've said, oh, well, these are just hallucinations of a dying brain caused by anoxia and uh, the hyperactivity of dying brains. Um, and uh, there's nothing to it except that. Um, however, more detailed studies have shown it's not too simple an explanation. The uh, Dutch cardiologist, Pim van Lommel, has done uh, a study where uh, in heart operations, they actually cool people down and they stop their heart so they can operate on the heart. And you can't do it for long, obviously, because the person will die, but this is a standard procedure. And when they're doing it, they monitor brainwave activity because you have to check what's happening in the brain. Now, in these operations, Van Lommel interviewed people after these operations, which are standard uh, kinds of operations nowadays, and found that many of them had had near-death experiences. They'd had them when their brain was flatlined. There was no brain activity whatever. Um, it, there was none of these normal electrical rhythms in the brain. Moreover, some of them could describe scenes that happened while they were uh, under anesthetic in the operation. They described things that had happened in the operating theater they couldn't have known. But they said they saw them. They floated out of their body and actually saw these things that had really happened. I think the evidence is very good that near-death experiences uh, do involve people's center of consciousness moving out of their body. Uh, they have a transformative effect on, on their lives. Another scientific aspect of this is that some drugs can produce something very like a near-death experience, particularly the drug DMT, dimethyltryptamine, um, which has an, very, it's the most powerful of all psychedelics. It produces an extremely intense... Trip. Uh, people who take it find themselves going out of their body 
through a kind of porthole into a realm of light and vision and then returning back to their body feeling their life's been completely changed. The whole thing takes about five minutes. And, and for many people it's one of the most significant moments in their lives. Um, I'm not here advocating the use of psychedelics, uh, of course, uh, but um, um, I, I can just say this is a, it does shed another light on the near-death experience because the, here's a way in which they can actually be produced almost at will. But the, point I, the thought I want to leave you with here is that producing them almost at will may have been going on for a very long time. What if you have a rite of passage or initiation where somebody is almost killed and then they come back to life so that they've had a near-death experience almost on demand. I think this is at the very heart of the Christian tradition. John the Baptist, in my belief, was a drowner. John the Baptist had people queuing up on the banks of the River Jordan. Um, he held them under and uh, then he brought them up again and they said they died, they'd been come to life again, their life had been completely changed, they'd been born again. And this is what they said, and they were queuing up on the banks. Now, in those days, they didn't have litigation and health and safety and stuff. <laughs> and <clears throat> I mean, he might have lost a few. Um, um, <laughs> but um, everything that you read in the New Testament about this experience of John the Baptist, including the baptism of Jesus, which uh, was a completely transformative event in his life, uh, fits perfectly if these were near-death experiences, that's what they said they were. You've died and born again, seen the light, and, been in a, and, and lost the fear of death. It makes complete sense. Um, whereas saying it's just symbolic, it doesn't really make much sense, because something only works as a symbol if it's a symbol of something. And what it's a symbol of is a near-death experience. Well, why have a symbol when you can have the real thing? Um, so, now, in the practice of most modern churches is of infant baptism, sprinkling water on babies. Obviously, it would, be, uh, it would contravene all rules of ethics and norms to <laughs> drown, nearly drown babies. Um, but one of the things that makes the Baptists a particularly interesting Christian sect, I mean, they get the worst press of all Christian sects, the Baptists. But I think one of the things about Baptists that's interesting is that they alone uh, have made a point of sticking to the original tradition of baptism. Baptist preachers immerse people in water. They either have tanks in churches or they do it in rivers or lakes. And the Baptists are the people, the born-again Christians, who get such a bad press, who say that they've died and been born again. They're the people who keep alive this tradition. And I don't know how far they go. I don't know many Baptists. I, I only know one Baptist, Southern Baptist, actually, Jerry Hall, Mix Jagger's ex. Um, and I said to Jerry, you know, what was it like when you were baptized? And she said, well, she said, first of all, it was very public. She said, in my church in Texas, she said, the, the baptismal thing's like a giant aquarium with a glass wall so everyone can watch. And, <laughs> and I said, well, when the minister held you under, did it, did, what was it like? She said, it was a lot longer than was comfortable, she said. Um, so... Still, in, in the US, and, and in English Baptists too, still have baptism by total immersion, um, this tradition is kept alive. Now, to what extent it goes as far as a near-death experience today, I don't know. This would be an interesting line of research to interviewing Baptists who've had the near-death experience or claim they've died and been born again. My own view of the Christian... I'm a practicing Anglican, and my own view of the Catholic Church... Um, is that the Catholic Church is all the churches. It's the universal church, including the Roman Catholics, Anglicans, Baptists, Methodists, all churches, I think, constitute the universal church. And I think different branches of it specialize in different things. The Baptists specialize in this particular death and rebirth rite of passage. And um, I think we have a lot to learn from them, really. Others specialize in other things. Quakers specialize in being quiet together. And you know, other churches are rather noisy by comparison. Um, so I think when you, take, when you look at the broad spectrum of what's there, it's a, an extraordinarily rich uh, combination of practices uh, that's possible. Now, <clears throat> finally, um, 
I want to talk about rituals. Morphic resonance is my own particular theory of memory and nature. Um, it's similar to theories by other people um, that uh, C.S. Peirce, the American uh, philosopher, in around 1900 suggested that in an evolving universe the laws of nature may be more like habits. The physicist Lee Smolin, in his recent book Time Reborn, argues much the same, that the laws of nature are like habits. Now this is one of the points I make too. I think the way the habits work is through morphic resonance, which means similar things influence subsequent similar things across space and time. What this means is that everything in nature has a kind of collective memory. Crystals have a collective memory of previous crystals of their kind. And when you make a new chemical, the more of the new chemicals you make, the easier it gets for them to crystallize all over the world. This works in animal behavior. If you train rats to learn a new trick, rats all around the world can learn it quicker because the rats have learned it in one place. Uh, they can learn it quicker elsewhere. I give the evidence and the uh, data for this in my books, A New Science of Life and the Presence of the Past, and it's summarized in The Science Delusion. This means each species has a kind of collective memory. Each individual draws upon and contributes to the collective memory of its species. Um, this is a bit like Jung's idea of the collective unconscious, uh, which he thought of as a kind of collective memory. I'm saying the collective unconscious is the human aspect of this collective memory, but all species, I think, have collective memories. And the way that morphic resonance works is on the basis of similarity. If something's similar to the way it's happened before, there'll be a resonance. Now, the reason this is relevant to rituals is because all religions and all social groups that are coherent have rituals. Um, and rituals fulfill particular role in a society, what they do is reenact the creation myth of that group, the, the story of origins of that group. Um, and by taking part in the ritual, uh, members of the group in the present are connected with other members of their group in the present, but also with all those who've done it before them, who've gone before them. So, for example, the Jewish ritual of the Passover um, reenacts the first Passover when the Jewish people left Egypt on their journey through uh, the wilderness to the Promised Land. And in that Passover, they had a particular feast. They had lamb, or, uh, and, and there are details given in the Old Testament as to what that was like. And every year, Jewish people reenact that Passover meal. And the story is told every year. The youngest child says, why is this night not like any other night? And the story is told, and so this is remembered uh, every year um, through the reenacting of this meal. Through taking part in it, Jewish people affirm their Jewish identity and their connection with other members of the Jewish group in the present, but also with all those who've gone before right back to the first Passover. The Christian Holy Communion itself, a Passover meal, um, is a, a reenactment of the primary event that created the Christian community, namely Jesus' Last Supper with his disciples. And that's reenacted in every Mass or Eucharist. The American Thanksgiving dinner is an example of a secular ritual, again, a shared meal. Uh, the story is of the first get, giving, like the first harvest festival, dinner of Thanksgiving for the first settlers in the New World. And so they reenact that Thanksgiving dinner every year that's a national ritual. By taking part, people become Americans. It makes them an American identity and connects them with Americans who've gone before. For those of us who are not American, it has no particular significance. But for Americans, it's very, very important. All societies, all cultures have rituals. And rituals are highly conservative. People believe that for the ritual to work, it should be done the right way. So the Thanksgiving dinner should have a turkey an American bird, and it probably doesn't feel quite the same with a nut roast. Um, uh, but, um, so, um, but at least it's a roast, the nut roast. Um, um, so um, they, they, they have to be done the same way, and the languages of rituals are highly conservative. In the Coptic church in Egypt, the liturgy is in ancient Egyptian. It's the only form in which that survives. Brahminic rituals in India are in Sanskrit. Um, 
in the Russian Orthodox Church, they're in Old Slavic. Um, in the Roman Church, until recently, they were in Latin. And in the Church of England, many people prefer the Book of Common Prayer, the, which has a 16th century form of the prayers with thee and thou, to the modern language form, because they feel that the traditional form is better, even if you can't understand it as well. Now, why is it that everywhere in the world, in all contexts, secular and religious, we find this high conservatism of rituals? I think it's because by doing things in such a similar way as they've been done before, with the right food, the right smells, the right words, the right phrases, uh, you set up the perfect conditions for morphic resonance. The present participants will resonate by morphic resonance with those who've done the ritual before. And there will be a literal collapse of time, a presence of the past, connecting the present performers of the ritual with those who've done it in the past. This is something in all societies taken for granted, except for modern uh, Western secular society, that the community doesn't just consist of living people, it includes the ancestors, the dead, those who've gone before. Um, in Africa, this is completely taken for granted by almost everybody. In China, traditional Chinese homes have ancestor shrines. I mean, in England, as far as it goes for most people, is pictures of grandparents on the mantelpiece, but still, it's the same idea. Uh, that you remain connected with those who've gone before. And in religious contexts, in, in Buddhism, the people who, in, uh, as a form of, in Tibetan Buddhism, a practice called Guru Puja, where uh, people invoke the Guru and the whole lineage of Gurus who've gone before. They connect with them. In Christianity, those who take part in Holy Communion are taking part not just with those today, but with the communion of saints, uh, which it says in the prayer book is the blessed company of all faithful people, alive and dead. They're all part of that community. So rituals have this particularly powerful uh, effect, and that's why they're so important for social cohesion. That's why, in my opinion, an entirely secular society, which has just simply discarded all these traditions, sacred places, rituals, prayer, uh, and so forth, is a very impoverished society. And it's not surprising, I think, that such societies have as their characteristic feature, as a mental feature, depression, endemic depression on a mass scale. Um, so I think these are part of a normal way of being human. And, and, and you know, you may not like Christian rituals, then you can do other ones. And you may not like other ones, you can do Christian ones. There's a choice of rituals. But for those of us who come from a Christian background, the ones that make most sense are Christian ones, I think. And that's one reason I uh, follow the Christian tradition. Um, so, mantras, uh, just uh, to bring out the final point here, mantras are sacred phrases um, which um, don't have any particular discursive meaning. The great Hindu mantra, Om, for example, is, is not something you're trying to communicate a meaning with it. By chanting these mantras, you enter into resonance with other people chanting it at the same time, literally into resonance, because if you chant together, you're resonating together. My wife, Jill Purse, gives workshops on sound and chanting, and so I've often experienced this power of group chanting uh, with her, and in other contexts as well. Um, but this, it's a very powerful thing to chant together in such a way that you're in, you're in resonance with all the members of the group, and when you chant in churches the psalms or the, sing hymns together, again, you're singing, you're in resonance, you're taking breaths at the same time, you're singing the same notes, you're resonating together. But you're also not just resonating with people in the present. There's a resonance, a morphic resonance involved in mantras which connects you with all those who've chanted the same mantra before. In some Hindu traditions of meditation, when you're given a mantra to meditate with, you're told don't use this mantra, bandy it around in ordinary conversation because you'll weaken its power. And it's easy to see why that could be so because when you chant the mantra, if you chant it, if people have only chanted it when they're meditating, you'll tune into yourself and to other people who've been in a meditative state. But if people have just treated it as a joke in a dinner party conversation or something, you'll tune into that as well and it will weaken its power. That's why all religions have prohibitions against blasphemy, which is the wrong use of sacred words. Um, 
And, I mean, in the modern world, these things make no sense to most people. They say, oh, it's a stupid law. The National Secular Society is, oh, we should abolish all laws. It's ridiculous, it's stupid, it's superstitious, and so forth. These, these objections, I think, are, are often very superficial and are based on the idea that the only thing that counts is sort of rational science. In fact, for most people, uh, all these other things are very important. They're a very important part of their lives. So... Um, these are four areas, uh, the <coughs> these areas that I've talked about this evening. Um, first of all, intention and its power. Secondary, sacred places as joining between heaven and earth. Thirdly, near-death experiences and their significance. And fourthly, rituals and how we can see them in a new way in the light of morphic resonance. Um, these are ways in which I feel that the insights of science as it develops and moves beyond the materialist framework um, um, open up new areas of discourse or dialogue between the realms of science and spirituality which could benefit both. Because if you think about it, what the sciences have done is to give us a very enlarged picture of the physical world. They've done a brilliant job. I mean, there's huge effects of technology. All of us benefit from it. But also the sciences have opened up the realm of the microscopic atoms, molecules, cellular structure. No one knew about those things before. They've opened up the universe in a way that nobody ever knew about in the past. No one knew there were any galaxies beside our own until the 1920s. Um, the fact that this vast universe, 14, 000, uh, 14 billion years old, uh, that's been growing and expanding, these are completely new insights. But they're insights that are devoid of meaning. The only meaning you get from, if you go to a planetarium display, is, you know, there are billions of galaxies and we're on a tiny speck of dust in this tiny corner of this galaxy. The message you get is we're totally insignificant in a universe that vastly overwhelms us in size and scale. And, and the, the message you get from regular science is we're here just by chance, the universe has no purpose or direction, our minds are nothing but our brains, and evolution is driven by random mutations and the blind forces of natural selection. <laughs> Pretty depressing view of the world. Now, um, as I show in the science delusion, I don't think it's true. I don't think we have to believe it. I think it's based on assumptions that science has superseded. But to recover a sense of what this great cosmos is about, why there are all these billions of galaxies, what they might mean, is something that traditional religions can't tell us because they didn't know about them. Um, uh, they, the galaxies, they were completely unknown to ancient Christians, Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, and everybody, and shamans even. Um, so um, they, they, we have this new vision, but it's a vision that's had the meaning drained out of it. So I think the joint task of the sciences and the religious imagination, and the poetic imagination, which is so much part of the religious mind, uh, is to rediscover and, and reimagine this vast cosmos that we're in. Because the, the science isn't going to do it for us. It's going to give us the facts, but that's all. And um, to have meaning, connection, purpose, we're going to need the religious imagination, or at least the poetic imagination. So I think this is a very exciting period to be in, and I think that we're entering a completely new era where that old standoff between dogmatic religion and dogmatic science can give rise to something much, much more interesting, a, a fruitful dialogue that could enrich all our lives. Thank you. Thank you.